Thank you for coming, first of all. Very precious, the public we have today here. This is this should be the opening keynote that we should be doing uh, during the first term, but we never do it during the first term because we are so busy and we always end up doing it during the second term or even as late as now, so I don't say opening keynote, but it's a keynote we, we want to always offer to our students uh, to have to get inspiration from profiles that can be professional or scholar, but that can be uh, an example for all of you. And that's why today we are so happy, uh, Pilar Medina and myself, because actually it was Pilar who suggested her name to me, to introduce you Claudia Frontino, who is a, a young photojournalist, but with a wonderful, wonderful profile, very, very fitting our, our master for her to explain us uh, her career, her work, and to illustrate it with, with images. Claudia, if you have read the summary uh, with uh, her bio that we circulated, you can see that she has studied in the Autonomous University of Barcelona, and she has been awarded uh, several times uh, for her work. And I think She's also an example of how you can organize in a way which is not fitting this pressure that capitalism puts on us. She works in a cooperative that she's also going to explain to us. So I, I, we thought it's a wonderful example of a young professional emerging and very nice working professional here in Catalonia with a profile that may be very, very close to all of you regardless what you want to do in, in the future. So, as you have seen, the, the title of her speech is Communicating Inequalities, Photography and Journalism for Change. And I welcome you and thank you so much for being here, Claudia. Okay. Thank you very much. Bona tarda, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Nuria and Pilar, for having me today. Um, it's very exciting for me to be here today because it's been a while. I don't come to uni. <laughs> um, Nuria said I'm young. I am young, but I'm not as young as you are. So it's very, it's very, I don't know, it's a very special occasion for me today. Um, first of all, I would like to tell you that please interrupt me whenever you want because um, I've prepared some slides to share my experience, but for me, the, the most interesting thing today, sorry, is to share with you. Um, we've prepared um, some minutes at the end where we can debate and discuss, but feel free anytime to you know, raise your hand and ask or comment anything, okay? So, um, uh, you will see in all of my slides or in almost all of them, some pictures because as Nuria said, I'm photographer and I'm journalist. Uh, some people ask me, are you a photojournalist? And I say, it depends on the day. <laughs> so some days I'm journalist, some days I'm photographer, and some other days I'm both, okay? Um, so I thought that would be more interesting for all of us to see some of the pictures, and if you wanna know the story behind, if I don't explain it, just ask, okay? Um, so for me, uh, journalism and photography, are both two tools, very powerful, but um, when Nuria asked me if I wanted to, to give this keynote and today, I thought that it would be a really, really good um, opportunity for me to stress out that both photography and journalism are mm, jobs or yeah, activities, uh, if you wanna put it this way, um, with loads of responsibility and this is something that no one told me when I was studying in Universidad Autónoma. Um, and I, I've learned on the way, you know? Um, and this is very, very important because with the things you do, you say, you ask, you take pictures of, you have lots of responsibility um, because this is the story which is gonna be told. You know, so uh, I don't know what do you want to do when you finish these masters. Maybe we can discuss <laughs> on this later. But um, communicating things, communicating communicating the world, 
it takes a lot of responsibility, regardless if you do it by writing or with images, or I don't know if you want to do something extra. Um, who tells the world? From which perspective? With which purpose? Those are questions that are in my mind constantly because um, I don't want to forget this responsibility I have in my job. Um, and this is something I wanted to put in your head now, you know, um, because um, something I've seen in these years is that um, mostly in photojournalism, at least, uh, the world is explained or is told by white male uh, photographers from the north going south and, you know, being experts uh, on every topic. And also in journalism, I think this is that something that happens as well. Maybe not um, like north and south, and that happens too, but um, maybe with more like privileged people talking to or about um, poor people or people which are in vulnerable situations. So this is why I understand as responsibility. Um, for me, journalism and photography are meant to make a difference. That's why the, the name of the keynote, uh, because we have this responsibility to make a change and to change the narratives and the way the, the world is told so far. Um, as Nuria said, um, when I graduated in journalism, uh, then I I joined a postgraduate degree in online media at uh, Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. The, this is online uni. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, and then, because uh, in the degree of journalism, it's it was for it's four years now as well. But um, if you imagine four years, and I was inter I was interested in photography, I only had one subject in photography in four years. And it was analog, which is fine because I like analog photography, but um, I wasn't happy with this subject. So when I finished the degree uh, in journalism and then the online media, I decided to join an alternative photography school. It doesn't exist anymore. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but um, it was located in Pobla Sec neighborhood. So in the other side of Barcelona. Um, and I decided to go to that school because they had this alternative female uh, bit underground perspective of photography. Uh, everything I didn't have in uni. <laughs> um, and it was very useful for me because I learned about some photographers I've never heard of. It was the first time someone told me that Robert Capa doesn't exist. Do you know who Robert, Robert Capa was? Great. So Robert Capra <laughs> was a character, an invented character, by Gerda Taro and Andre, I don't remember their surname, name, um, but because they, they were a couple and they wanted to succeed in photojournalism in the 30s. Uh, they decided to come to Spain because of the civil war and to explain it to the world, but because of their names, uh, no one cared about them, so they decided to join and to invent this character called Robert Capa. Uh, Robert Capa became so famous, as famous as the, in this subject in uni, teacher, a very well-known teacher, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say the name, but um, he told us that, oh, Robert Capa was one of the best photojournalists um, in the world, in the Civil War, you know, the archive, he left. Then when I joined this other school, I realized that Robert Capa didn't exist at all. And as always happens, Gerda Taro was, the, was really forgotten. Uh, she died before his uh, mate, his male uh, mate, but um, I encourage you to search on Gerda Taro's archive, also because it was, um, I don't know how many years ago, but recently, um, people discovered the Mexican suitcase um, and they did this documentary on Gerda Taro's story and archive. And I think it's really, really interesting for you because it's related to how the world is told and who tells the story. So um, yeah, I studied in this school 
And then I moved to Vienna because I was a bit lost. That's something that happened to many of my friends uh, when we finished uni because we had this huge crisis here in, in Spain. Um, no jobs, <laughs> no future perspectives. So in my case, I, I went to Vienna for six months because I got a really um, bad job actually because I, was <laughs> I wasn't well paid, but I went to this company called Lomography. I don't know if you've heard of it. I, I see one face, no, yeah. Um, I was there as an intern, sort of, but um, I didn't learn much about photography. I didn't earn much money, but the good thing I, <laughs> I got from this job is my love for analog photography since then. Uh, I think that picture is the one you've seen in the poster. Um, so since uh, this Vienna period of my life, I started taking analog pictures and also I discovered the um, self-portrait um, practice. And that's something that I really, really enjoy. So thank you, Vienna, for that. <laughs> um, yeah. And then when I came back from Vienna, I needed money, I needed a job uh, because I wanted to leave my parents' house. <laughs> I wanted to come to live to Barcelona. So I started working in an online company, online marketing company. Uh, I stayed there for three years because I wanted to save money and then do what I really wanted to do, which was journalism and photography and trying to change the world. So, um, yeah, I stayed there three years um, and then I became freelance. It was something quite dangerous <laughs> for me to do, despite I saved money. But um, rooms in Barcelona at that time were much cheaper, I have to say. I was paying like 350 euros, um, like all included. I don't know how much you're paying now. I don't want to <laughs> know. But um, I saved enough to, to leave my, my family's house. So yeah, I started as a freelance. Um, I didn't have much many jobs by that time, but because uh, at the same time I was working in this online marketing company, I was doing extra jobs on my free time. Um, so I started teaching, I started writing, like everything I could do, I was doing that. Um, and yeah, then I started doing, uh, writing as a contributor to a newspaper called ARA. It's in Catalan. I think they had some articles in English and Spanish too. Um, so until today, yeah. Till today, I'm still a contributor to this newspaper. Something I really wanted to share with you as well is that um, it's been a while now that I'm a guide for schools in the World Press Photo Exhibition here in Barcelona. I don't know if you've been last year. Yeah. Okay, so I do this for schools, teenagers, kids. Sometimes it's quite hard because they don't pay attention at all. So, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think it's interesting because um, it allows me to, um, to try to, you know, leave some messages about, um, you know, like critical thinking and, I don't know, give advice to them on don't believe everything you see in a picture, um, what's going on, okay, you don't see it, you know it, you have to read the text, you know, so on. So, um, yeah, I'm critical to WordPress photo exhibition too, I had to say, because for so many years, now it's changing a bit, but for so many years, in WordPress photo contest, happened what I was telling you before, that male from the north telling stories from the south. They are trying to change, the, change these, at least in the couple, the couple last years. Um, and since 2021, I became a member of Agencia Dalaya, as Nuria said. This is our cooperative I work in. And I do plenty of things. <laughs> I'm a communicator, I'm a teacher, I'm a photographer, and I'm a journalist. And I wanted to share a little bit, like quickly, but um, so you know what do we do and why I joined this cooperative and I left my freelance <laughs> experience. Um, I wanted to introduce you my colleagues, Sara, the one in the middle, and Laura, Laura in English, but Laura, um, 
Sara is one of the founders of the cooperative. I joined in 2021 and Laura joined us last year. She's the youngest <laughs> and sometimes she sees us as boomers. Um, but we try to keep on, you know, the young uh, rhythm and the technologies and everything. Um, Agencia Talaya actually means Watchtower Agency. Um, can you guess why the name is Watchtower? Any guess? Do you know what a Watchtower is? By the draw, maybe? Um, the Watchtower is a building uh, with the purpose of being able to see everything happening and is a point of um, alert too. No, You see something and then you can communicate, you can explain what's going on because you have this high point of view of the world. So that's why <laughs> the name of the agency. Actually, we are a non-profit cooperative, meaning that everything we earn, we use it for our own work. So we don't have benefits and if we have it, we have to invest it in the company. We work as a team, a small team, <laughs> but um, the good thing about it is that we can make, take decisions and make decisions. Uh, Sarah and I, we are um, socios. Um, how do you say? Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, it sounds very capitalist. <laughs> but we are the ones mm, taking, making decisions and Laura, she's a worker. But we also, we talk everything and we make decisions all together. And we also work with some other cooperatives or organizations because for us, the, the point of being a cooperative and not a um, regular company is um, helping each other, learning from each other. And for example, offering services like, um, if we don't do something, we do a lot of things. But for example, if someone asks us to do graphic design, we don't do that. But we can ask some colleagues from another cooperative or organization to do it for us. Obviously, we pay them. <laughs> but then if someone needs a video, uh, we can do it for them and so on. So for us, it's a more you know, like natural way of working. Um, and we are specialized in feminism, critical thinking, and migrations. You will see now that I will show you some projects and you will see the topics we, we work in. No questions so far? Okay, I go. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about two projects we've Done, um, we've done so many others, and because uh, Pilar um, is handling the, the brochures, you can scan the QR, and it's in Catalan, but I think you will manage to see more or less what we do. Um, yeah, we'll show, because Nuri is taking pictures, so <laughs> you can see pictures now, and then I go back. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, two years ago, the Ukrainian, the Russian war in Ukraine started. Um, so we decided to move to Poland, to the border of Poland with Ukraine, to try to um, to explain what was going on. We are not war photographers and war journalists, so we didn't go to Ukraine. But because um, we are specialized in migrations and human rights, we wanted to know how the um, how was it the the arrival of ukrainian people to the border in poland because um our experience in borders was very different what we was we were watching on tv and what we were reading on the newspapers so if i say border and now i would really like you to answer what do you think of a border for you Space of separation, great, thank you. Where else? Military, Military yeah. Security. Security. Fences, okay. So very hostile, right? Um, I imagine a border as um, a separation between two places and in one place, some people are not welcome and not allowed. So, um, in the cooperative, um, my colleagues um, worked in the um, south of Spain, the, the border 
and in Melilla, do you know? Um, in Andalusia, in the south of Spain, and then um, in the north of Africa, actually. Before Morocco, you can see Ceuta, Melilla. So in Melilla, there's a huge fence. It's one of the most dangerous and biggest fences in, I would say, not the world, but in the UA, for sure. UE. Hi. <laughs> um, so we wanted to go to, to Poland to see how these people were welcome, if they were welcomed, and to see what was going on in there and why that was so different to the south of Spain, for example, or I don't know, the border in, um, between Mexico and the US or um, in some other countries in, in the European uh, Union. So instead of the borders we usually imagine or the ones we were um, used to see um, here in, in the United, uh, United in the European Union, uh, what we saw were loads of family being welcomed, so many children, and they were rehoused or um, they were helped to go to some other places in Poland or in Germany um, or even here in Spain. We see loads of coaches uh, from Spain uh, telling people, yeah, come here. And we were like, where is these people going? What are you going to do with them? We don't know, we will see. Just jump into the bus or the coach and we will manage on the way to Spain. I'm like, okay. Um, we ask so many others, like, where's your next ex destination? Do you know anyone else? And say, no. We just jump from one train to another and we go to Krakow or we go to Berlin or, you know, so many different places. And we ask, because we saw that um, in the places we've, we moved, um, everyone was so welcome and people helping a lot. But we heard that in the border uh, between Poland and Belarus, uh, there's a huge fence actually, and journalists were banned to go there. And the police, the military, um, the army, they were um, avoiding, well, they were pushing back people uh, from one side of the border to another. So in the news, we only saw the nice uh, face of Poland, but um, the other one, no, the one in the north, um, didn't appear in the news at all. Um, so having already documented in the cooperative uh, the arrival of migrant people and refugees in other places. Um, the trip to Poland for us was both help, hopeful and angering, you know, because um, on one side it was hopeful because we saw that if you want to do it, you can do it. I mean, helping, of course, traveling, it depends on um, your economical situation, health and so on. But if you want to help people to cross borders and you want to rehouse them and you want to help them, you can do it as a political, you know, responsible. But um, when it's not done, it's because there's no will and there's loads of racism. So we were like, we spent a week um, moving to different points of the border. Um, and we were like, I don't know, like both feelings at the same time. It was so weird for us because we were happy for these people that were welcomed and rehoused so quickly but we were sad for those we've known. And also because we met some non-white Ukrainian um, people, uh, or people that were living in Ukrainian for many reasons, but they weren't white, and they had so much trouble comparing to the other ones, uh, moving to one point, from one point to another. Um, here you can see uh, the coaches I was telling you about. Here you would see the, the train station, one of the main train stations. And there you can see children. They, um, they were traveling with just one bag each. Um, and yeah, it was funny to talk to Spanish people, <laughs> asking them like, hey, what are you doing here? Yeah, I just came here. I asked my company for some holidays and I'm here to help. It's like, okay. I hope to see you <laughs> somewhere else uh, in another time, yeah. And here I wanted to show you, because we contact um, Clowns Without Borders, I don't know if 
Do you know them? Um, they work around the world in different groups and they travel to um, places where people need some laughs and some love. Um, so as I knew them from another trip I took to Bosnia, um, I contacted them and they told me that there was a, this expedition, this, this group of people traveling there at the same time. So we went to um, Medica, which is really, really the, the border, um, and they were doing this, yeah, I don't know how to say it. Yeah. This is spectacle. Yeah, the show, thank you. They were doing this show for the families. Here you only see children, but there were lots of adults also laughing and having a great time, at least for one hour that the show lasts. But we wanted to, um, to explain this as well, because um, as you can see at the background, there were lots of drawings, uh, toys, uh, everybody prepare everything for the the kids to enjoy and have fun for for this time. But um, there were a lot of um, bad bunks uh, in in here um, because they didn't know how long that would take for them to be rehoused or to to get a train ticket or to move um, to a safer place. And we published um, some pictures in, in the Yara newspaper. I heard a noise. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we published this uh, because we wanted to thank um, um, Clowns Without Borders. Uh, they allowed us to, to be there. We also uh, went with them to a mall, but we couldn't take pictures there because um, there were so many children and some of them, the children and the families, weren't well, like health issues, and because they were, they really needed to, you know, take a rest, and they didn't want to see us taking pictures and being around. But yeah, we published this as well. Um, recently, we've been asked to run a workshop uh, for young students, younger students, um, like teenagers, basically. Uh, inside a project called Bibliotecas Sense Fronteras, Libraries Without Borders. Um, the workshop is called Explaining the World Through Images, Critic, Photojournalism, and, and we are doing this um, around Catalonia. Me, actually, <laughs> I'm the one going to village, <laughs> different villages and cities. Um, this week, I'm staying in Barcelona the whole week. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm going up and down in Catalonia doing this workshop because um, we've been hired because of our background and our critical point of view of things. And um, it's it's a great experience. It's, it's been a great experience so far because I'm able to tell teenagers about this Robert Kappa thing I was, I was telling you about because I can show female photographers I really admire because I can tell them what what sh you shouldn't do on social media, for example, with images, to show them bad influencer examples, you know. So it's it's funny for me, but I think it's so interesting for them to learn um, out of the you know curricular um, space, because we do it in libraries. That's why the libraries without borders um, so we take them out of the class we change the place we change the person no it's not the, te the regular teacher and um, we can debate with them on how the stories are told and how should be told actually um, this is from last week or two weeks ago okay no questions no okay <laughs> I don't know um, but I will rush a bit. Um, so those last pro um, projects were made in the cooperative, but I wanted to talk to you, to share you with you uh, the project I spend more time with, and which is still ongoing, and it's about female homelessness. I don't know if you've heard about this term before. No, homelessness, yes, but maybe not female. It's very specific. Um, is specific because it's unknown, at least in Barcelona. Um, now I think 
I've been living in Barcelona for eight years so far, eight, nine years. And um, I realized that in city center, I mean, Plaza Catalunya and the main streets, maybe here in Poblano too, but uh, I don't come often here. But I, I, I saw so many men living or being in the street with tents or, you know, like their, their things. Um, but I didn't see women or I see so little that I asked myself, like, oh, is this only a men thing? Or is there any woman there and I cannot see it? So um, it's been four years now that I'm investigating on this topic because I thought if I'm wondering this, maybe someone else can wonder about uh, female homelessness. So I started a research, but I was very lucky uh, to win a prize uh, because I started this when I was a freelance uh, on my free time and with no resources apart from my time and my money. And it was very difficult for me because I don't know, I knocked on so many doors and people were like, <laughs> who are you? What are, why are you doing this? And uh, only one organization paid attention to me at that time in No Barri's neighborhood. Um, so I was able to go there a couple of times a week to take coffee with women. Um, but since I won this prize, the Montserrat Roig, which is a prize for journalists, uh, both it could be both for a thing you've already published or for an investigation you want to um, carry. Uh, so I applied for the second one because I wanted to have free time and money to do, to do that. Uh, so I was lucky to win this, um, and that allowed me to, to carry this uh, research. Um, it took me one year. I mean, it's been four and a half years now, but to, the, to do this uh, research, it took me one year, and then I had to publish it somewhere. So I published it in a newspaper. Uh, I can show you later if you want, because it's online. Hi. It's online, both in Catalan and Spanish, but because you will already know the topic because I'm going to share it to you and you will see pictures, I think you can guess more or less what's, what is it about. Um, so yeah, I published this one year investigation in the newspaper and then I applied for some prizes and I won them <laughs> because um, the jury in the, the different um, prizes, they... Um, they saw as well that it was a very invisible topic. And here, not only in Barcelona, but in Catalonia, no one, um, I mean, there was research and academical research, but not journalist, um, journalistic and photograph photographic, sorry, uh, research. And, and they thought that I was able to, I mean, like map, to, you know, to show, so many different experiences and stories and causes and consequences that uh, that was a really good example for people, like regular people, not academical, not professional, to understand this phenomenon. Um, this is one of the most difficult pictures I took. I wanted to tell you that it wasn't me with a camera pointing at random women. I asked uh, organizations here in Barcelona to help me first to understand the phenomenon and then to introduce me to some of the women they were uh, working with because um, that was the, the normal way for me to understand um, the workflow. Um, so first understanding why are these women um, sleeping rough, why are they in prison, because my main point was trying to explain that even you don't see them sleeping rough, that doesn't mean that they don't have uh, a place to stay because some of them, they have roof, but if you are in prison, that's not a place. It's not a safe place. This is not a home. You have a roof, you are not sleeping rough, but is, this is not enough. Or if you are, um, if you live in your house, but you have an eviction notice, Eviction? You have an eviction notice. Um, this is not a safe place anymore. Or if you 
work um, caring for uh, an old person and you live and work in the same place, as soon as you are um, you lose your job, you lose your house. That happened here a lot while the COVID pandemic. Um, so there were so many different examples that I wanted to understand. So I asked first um, people working in the organizations to explain me and then to introduce me to these women uh, so I could interview them and then take pictures. So this picture came after so many hours of um, sharing with Julia uh, questions, um, doubts. I wanted to know about her. I wanted to know why she ended up from Peru to Barcelona, why she carried all her belongings with her every day. And one day she told me, no, I sleep here. So like, why? Do you know what this place is? Can you guess? Yeah, like lockers, storage, place, yeah. And this is in Raval, but I wanted to take the picture in a way that you couldn't recognize the actual place because I didn't want to put her in danger. Um, but yeah, she told me like, yeah, I sleep there. I was like, what? <laughs> so after like three times we met, the fourth time I asked her to, to go with her and she showed me. Um, some of the pictures I took, uh, you see faces, in some others you don't, because some of them were afraid of their because of their situation, and I had to respect that, of course. So I had to manage a way to take original pictures um, to explain their stories, uh, because it was not only with uh, images, it was written as well, but you will see why I needed great pictures. Um, as I said, um, female homelessness is a huge and complicated phenomenon, and it's not a natural phenomenon. And this is very important for me to tell you because um, sometimes in journalism or even in informal conversations with friends, family, uh, workmates, um, there's a lot of stereotypes, and people I've heard, I don't know if you've heard, but I've heard a lot like, they are there because they want, they don't want to be helped, um, it's their fault, you know? Have you heard any of this? Maybe you already thought of this and it's fine, I'm not going to judge you. Um, but for me it was very important to explain that this is not natural, this happens for one, two, three, many reasons, and um, is due to structural problems. Here in Barcelona, the biggest problem we have is housing. As I was saying before, I don't wanna know how much you pay for a room now for a flat, because it's um, in Spain and also in Europe, but uh, here in Spain and in Barcelona, we have really, we, we're struggling to pay our rent. And there are some laws that actually, they, they are thought to help these uh, rising prices, but it's not helping at all. Um, so we see evictions every day. Actually, in Catalonia now, in um, well, no, in 2023, um, there was an eviction every two hours in Catalonia. So that's a lot. In 2022, it was more than one eviction every hour. So eviction and a half every hour. Um, so talking about housing was a big thing for me. It was very important, but also which were the, um, the differences between male and female homelessness. And this was very hard for me because I needed to understand very well first to explain later to people, uh, not only in the, um, in the report I published, but because um, in a keynote like this, or even to my family, I wanted to explain it very well. Um, so, Gender-biased uh, violence is a very important thing to talk about when we talk about female homelessness. Um, also, job insecurity, uh, social exclusion, and all the difficulties we have for the, you know, for the fact of being women compared to men in, you know, in a job interview uh, or when you want to rent a flat and you are alone. 
uh, people don't want to, no, they don't want to rent to. Um, so I said prisons, but I forgot to talk about shacks, shacks, barracas. Actually, here in Poblano and Glorias, there were lots of shacks and um, informal settlements. Uh, also, abandoned warehouses as well, but they are cleaning them, they are wiping them out. Um, the woman on your right, um, Carmen, I met her. She's living now in Moncada y Rajac, which is a town really close to Barcelona, but she used to live in uh, Badajoz Street. It's two streets from here. And she told me that they were, um, they were, I don't know, so many families living together. And when they cut the light in the abandoned warehouse they were living in, they went to this uh, church in Badajoz Street because there was this street light that was the only one um, available by that time. So they took their cooking uh, tools and things uh, to cook under this street light. In, so she told me this is my, um, uh, how she said, Carrera de la Esperanza, no? How um, my, I don't know, Esperanza, hope. That was my hope street, my hope po um, spot in this street. So it's two streets from here. Um, yes. Yeah. Because uh, in prison women, um, I mean, they have roof, they have three meals a day, and they have showers. So some facilities and basic needs covered, but that's not your house, that's not your place. And I've met some of them that told me that when they went out, they yeah, they went out of prison, they had no place to go. And I've heard of some others that they prefer to um, the linky. What, to commit little um, off offense, offenses? No. Well, yeah, to go back because at least they had meal and roof. For me, this is very strong. Uh, no, when I heard that, that was really, really strong because, like, wow, you prefer that to being in the sleeping rough. Because for women, sleeping rough is is the last um, is like a state, the last um, a place they want to be because it's so dangerous for them because most of them, they suffer violence, they've been raped, um, they try to hide all the time or being with other male because they prefer to being abused by one male instead of 10. So yeah, they pre some of them, not all of them of course, but some of them prefer to be in prison or to be invisible than sleeping rough or yeah, because some of them also they sleep in random people's couches, uh, in chains, change of cleaning, or sexual favors. Yeah. Some of the um, artistic pictures I had to take because, for example, this was, um, she's Nora. Uh, Nora and Carmen are not the real names. Julia, that's her real name, but some of them ask also not showing faces and for me to change their names. Um, this picture was taken in the flat Nora was sleeping in, well, she was living, sorry, uh, for two years, two years and a half. This place is run by an organization called Al Casal dels Infants. And she arrived in Barcelona when she was 20. And it was so difficult for, for her because she arrived in the middle of the pandemic. So when I met her, she was explaining me how hard it was for a young woman, a girl to, um, to survive in a city like Barcelona. And um, while she was in this flat, she had to study. It was like this, this is a flat with terms, with conditions that you have to be in school. And once you finish school and you can get a job, you have to leave the flat and allow someone else to go in. Um, this floor is very typical in Catalonia and in old flats in Barcelona, so that's why I took the picture. Also, that was the day they were celebrating the end of the Ramadan uh, festivity. Uh, and after I took the picture, Nora told me, oh, I never wore those uh, slippers. 
uh, and say, it's fine because I like them, they're very glamorous, and I like with the floor, so let's take this picture. And it's one of my favorites, actually, um, because um, it shows when you want to be comfy at home, you use your pajamas, your random no, uh, glamorous um, slippers, but because of the floor, it's very typical in here. Um, I also took this photo of Juana, and this photo is very, very special to me because uh, Juana passed uh, this last January. Um, I couldn't take pictures of her in her last flat before she passed. Um, but this was the second flat she got uh, from an organization as well. And I liked this living room because it was like my granny's living room or like, I don't know, a very, very old and classical living room. Uh, she didn't choose the picture, she didn't choose the cushions, but it was like a proper house to her and she was sharing it with three more women. You can see the key. She always had her key uh, in, in the neck because she didn't want to lose the key of her room or her house. Um, and here she looks as she was angry, but <laughs> she wasn't. But she was uh, having her teeth fixed. Uh, she, she didn't want to, to laugh or smile because she was, you know, like, um, she didn't want us to see. <laughs> um, And another picture I couldn't take the, the face of Johanna. Johanna is the real name, but she at first she didn't want to show her face. Um, can you recognize the floor of the street? Yeah, that was also um, a great picture for me to take because if I'm talking about um, female homelessness in Barcelona, I wanted to show Barcelona somehow. So with the other floor of the house and this one in the, in the street, problem solved. <laughs> um, Johanna, she used to work as an intern, a 24-7 care person um, here in Barcelona. So she, she was a really good um, testimonial to talk about these problems, no? that when you're a migrant woman and you work for a family that is not yours and you work and live in the same place, um, you are under a lot of um, pressure. A lot of uh, rights are vulnerados. Mm. Violated. violated. Thank you. <laughs> are violated, um, like working rights, uh, living rights, human rights. Okay. So um, her testimonial was really, really useful to include these um, women in the in in the imaginary of the female uh, homelessness situation and phenomenon. Um, also because she joined a sort of union. Here in Barcelona, there are at least five organizations um, uh, with women working the care and housing, cleaning, Mujeres Palante, Mujeres, diversa, mujeres Migrantes Diversas, Sindillar, so there are like five at least, um, and it was a really good example of uh, self-organization because um, she's from Honduras and a lot of women from Honduras were in the same situation, um, mostly in the pandemic, but also before and now. So they, they are self-organized organized, and that was really, really good example for the society and for me to, to share with people. Um, and the same case with Ana Maria. Um, she's in a mirror, that's why you see the text. Um, it says Sindicat d'Habitatge de Gràcia. It's like the housing union of Gràcia's neighborhood. I say union, but it's not like a proper union, but it's an organized group. Here in Barcelona we have many because of the housing issues we have. Um, and this picture was taken in a flat. She was living until July last year. She was evicted with his 12-year um, son. This was an occupied building because it was empty. It belonged to, um, I don't know how it's in English, Fonculto, uh, from a bank. When banks um, 
buy house flats, but they don't use them. They are empty. There are so many empty buildings in Barcelona and in Catalonia, especially in Barcelona. But banks, this bank and this group, uh, Cerberus, they had this building um, empty. So five families occupied this building uh, with the help of this union uh, in Gracia. And one of these families was Ana Maria with uh, his 12 years old son. And they spent two years and a half there, two years, and they were evicted in, in July. Um, and this bank spent so much money because they evicted first a uh, family from the fifth floor, then the fourth floor, and then the same day, uh, the other three ones. But um, the fifth and the fourth floor were empty for in all this time, and they hired um, security in shifts of 12 hours, so 12 hours, one man, one man, and then another. They put so many security cameras, they put these um, security doors, so they spent lots of money instead of allowing, for example, these families to live there until they found a solution. So it, w it was a really, really moving and touching day because I was there with, um, with Ana Maria and all the people that were um, supporting her. She went afterwards to this old pension in near hospital clinic. And now I visited her three weeks ago and she was in another occupied flat somewhere, I cannot tell you, uh, but she is gonna be evicted anytime now. So I'm following her story. And here you can see that my research um, turned into two photo exhibitions. That's why I needed to take great pictures, apart from interviewing the women and taking good notes as well. Um, and if you want to see one of those exhibitions, <laughs> you can go to Valcarca Paniten's library. This is near the Vallebron Hospital. It's up in the mountain, but it, it's going to be there until the 11th uh, in this month, one well, of March, actually. Um, but I did this to make sure that no one in Barcelona can say I didn't know about it. So um, I published in the newspaper, and then I did those two exhibitions. This is the large format, and there's a smaller one. It's in at home now. It's packed. But that's the one that is traveling around several libraries in Barcelona because I don't know if you go to a library, but for me it's a really key point in the city because um, apart from going there to study, there's so many people to going there because it's warm or cold, no? Um, because they have a safe place, they have a roof, they have toilets, they can charge the mobile, they can search on the internet. And I've known so many women that told me that they go to a library just to stay there safe. So I thought that the best place in the city to bring this exhibition was a library. So yeah, Valcarga uh, Panitens is the library number six, six or seven. Yeah. So it's gonna be traveling the to two more places this year. But I really recommend you, not because I did it, but because I think you will um, understand uh, much better. And to finish, uh, I wanted to point out some challenges, observations and reflections uh, along these years. And I, write, I wrote here some real sentences I have to listen from men. <laughs> um, one of them told me, can I come and watch you teach a photography class? He was not even my student. He was a random person I met sometime. And he saw that I was teaching in Patillimona, Centra Civic Patillimona. Um, it's near the cathedral. And he actually sent me a Facebook text. Uh, hey, Claudia, I saw you're doing this can I come and watch you teach a photography class and say, why don't you join the course? And then <laughs> maybe it makes more sense for you to come instead of just being there watching me doing my things. Um, he never replied. <laughs> uh, another one told me, 
that was my, a real student of mine, he told me, can we meet for a drink and discuss what do you think of my classwork? And said, why don't you come to class next week? And we discuss it with the group. And then he said, yeah, I cannot come next class, uh, but I'm available for a drink. And I said, come to class. <laughs> and he said, oh, you journalists are always so polite. And I said, okay, never came <laughs> again to class. And another one told me, now you don't want to charge me for these pictures, do you? Don't be silly. Um, and this came because I took some pictures of this guy doing an activity as an exchange because I had to do this for, um, for my school, my photography school. And I said, okay, I can give you some of the pictures because you allowed me to be here and taking pictures of you doing this uh, for your website. Okay. But then I saw um, in a website uh, of a big institution here in Barcelona that they were using one of those pictures of mine. And I said, hey, why don't you tell them to you know, write my name or something, credit? And say, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. By the way, we're going to use one or two pictures of yours um, in a book we are publishing of our work, um, their work. Uh, he was in a cooperative too. And say, oh, interesting. Can I see the, like the mock-up and say, yeah, no problem. It wasn't one or two pictures, it was 10 of them. No one asked me permission for that and said, okay, I'm not comfortable with this. He said, don't worry if you think you have to um, charge me for this, we can you know, discuss it and say, yeah, I think so. Let's talk about it. And then he said that, like, mm, don't be silly. And I got paid for that. Not as much as I deserve and I want it, but I have to um, discuss and well, fight, not discuss, I had to fight <laughs> with him a bit. But that's something I've learned from these years that um, your job is not for free unless you arrange that in no, beforehand. Um, and I'm sure that he, they, the three cases, they did this because I was young, I was a woman, <laughs> and I was starting in this path of uh, being professional. So for me, it's sometimes even now a challenge to be younger than other colleagues, um, because I've received so many patronizing comments, as you've seen now, um, and make me, making me feeling that my work wasn't enough or wasn't you know, worth or good enough. Um, so I would say that machismo and uh, imposter syndrome, they go hand in hand, but I'm fighting it <laughs> as, as, as good as I can. Um, I wanted to show you, uh, you can see this fanzine in the Carmel library, in the library in the neighborhood of El Carmel. Uh, I published, I self-published this many years ago. Um, and I think it's related to those observations and reflections along this time, because I wanted to talk about menstruation and period um, and all the violences we received, uh, people menstruating. So um, I self-published this uh, with real sentences from ads, in, at least in, in Spanish ads, um, from pads, tampons, saying really, really silly things. But I put those sentences and then I took pictures of a friend. I have really good friends. <laughs> um, trying to, um, yeah, pair the feelings or the sensations I had while reading those sentences. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if you can read it. It's also in, in Spanish, but the, the last sentence says, libera de la regla, so get free from your period. It's like, yeah, thank you for the, <laughs> the adv <laughs> advising sentence, but the picture shows, you know, like embrace and love yourself despite, you know, your period or whatever happens to you. Um, and this fanzine, I sold all of them, uh, but I gave one, one of them um, to the library uh, in Carmel because they have this fanzinoteca 
and it's so good because they have um, like alternative fanzines with you know strong topics, and I wanted to to give one of them. So, luckily, <laughs> despite all the patronizing comments and all the efforts, you know, to um, to be freelance, to work as a freelance, to have a cooperative, the best things I have found along the way are friends and fellows <laughs> in journalism and photography, and also family, friends, so my people. And sharing the things that happened to me showed me that it didn't happen only to me. Um, sharing also with people that I don't know how to do this, how do you do it, or how can we do it, it's very valuable to me. And, and to end at the same way we, we started, I would say that one of the, the most important things to me is that the people dedicated, like in my case or my colleagues um, in the cooperative, to raising awareness and trying to make the world a better place. At least I say trying because I know it's a kind of a naive thing, but we try. Um, we have the responsibility to do it with respect for those who suffer. And also we, we have to point uh, the causes of the, inju the injustices. And if we can, and this is a very important thing that I'm trying to apply to myself, to point out possible solutions, you know, to try not to be sad all the time and angry, that happens. But if um, we know that some people are fighting and some people are doing things well, we have to give space to these people too, to, yeah, to tell and to explain. So thank you very much. <laughs> You can follow us, uh, <laughs> the cooperative, and myself on social media. To make questions without having to speak aloud. Um, I was wondering how you would describe your relationship, your connection with the people you're photographing. Uh, pho yeah, especially in the female homelessness project, how would you describe that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would say honest and sincere. I always try to explain myself on what am I doing, why am I doing this, what am I gonna do afterwards, no? The exhibition, I told all of them, like, I'm writing this, I'm taking pictures, but because I wanna tell people what's going on. And I always tell them, share as much as you like. If you don't wanna share with me something, it's fine. I don't need it. Um, for example, one of the women I met, she spent five years in prison. I never asked her why. She never explained, I'm fine with this, I don't need it. And some people, I know they wanna know but I don't care because, no, the important thing is that when she left prison, she had no place to stay. And for me, the, the important thing is why she has no place to stay. What happened? What, what's going on with women after prison? And why the system is not helping them instead of, you know, going to this reason of, yeah, what, what did she, I don't care what she did, it's fine. She's nice to me, I'm nice to her. And yeah, I apply the motto that do what people, what you want them, you know, for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, very much appreciated where the uh, photographs ended up, like when you explained that they were placed in the library and the significance of the library for these communities. Uh, and at the end, you said also that uh, it's important to point out possible solutions. And at the very start, you said that actually this uh, topic has been explored by academia and things like that. So I wonder if uh, you have projects or you've already done uh, any kind of uh, work based on the outcome to kind of maybe network with people who make policy or, uh, I don't know, or like urban collectives who work on these issues but haven't addressed female homelessness specifically, or where you see these, how you see this work contributing to a solution or something like that. 
Um, something I forgot to, to say, maybe with the case of Ana Maria, I, I say quickly, but I'm in touch with most of them still, um, because I met them in 2021. With some of them, it's difficult to catch up because the situations, but um, first I would say that, yeah, the most important thing to build this relation is to care about them and sending something really simple and easy, but you have to think about it, to send texts from time to time, like, hey, what's going on? How are you? What are you doing? And then being in touch with the organizations I met um, for the research, because um, sometimes they send me um, press release and things that say, okay, but I don't work in a newspaper, so thank you, but I cannot do something with, I, I do nothing with that, but I resend it to colleagues because I want no, that information to be published, so I'm sort of a bridge sometimes. Um, and also with the stories of them, because they are evolving. Um, Ana Maria, for example, Ana Maria, when I visited her three weeks ago, she explained me um, the eviction she was going to suffer, <laughs> um, but also the, the different unions from different neighborhoods, they were organizing to do this action in front of the um, one of the Ayuntamiento um, Barcelona offices, the one with um, social, right to social, yeah the social office of um, Ayuntamiento de Barcelona. So I say, okay, I can do a thing with this, but I'm gonna send it to this person and this person because I'm sure they can publish and that happened. So sometimes I'm, I'm playing this role of a, a bridge. Um, but also, for example, this week I'm writing um, an article on young, uh, on girl homelessness, for example. Um, and I think that's also very invisible because women are invisible, but young women are even more invisible. So I decided to write on this. Um, so that's my sort of activism <laughs> apart from my job because um, this article is for free. It's just because I feel it as a cause. Um, but I also, I was in touch with some academicals from UB, the Universitat de Barcelona. So I'm trying to, um, I don't know, update myself <laughs> on the topic, but because, um, for example, with the numbers, numbers are very important, but are so boring. Um, Arrels, Fundació Arrels, is a very well-known organization in Barcelona and in Catalonia, working with homelessness people since, I don't know, how many years. But they are not specialized on attention to women. So I ask them, like, what are you doing to help women in Barcelona? And, and they are trying to change things. So for me, also, our role is... Um, I don't know how to put it, but asking organizations or professionals what are they doing and if they are doing something to explain it you know, to the uh, society. But if not, also explain that. Like there's a lack of um, policies, for example. And something I've learned is that um, since the pandemic, pandemic um, some of the organizations and teams realized that something as silly as having um, separate um, showers or, um, I don't know, having menstrual products. Um, they, I don't know, they, they didn't th think about this. And because women were in the street or they lost their job because they were working you know, in a family's house and so on, they saw there was an emergency to help with a specific um, women policies. Um, gender policies, so they are trying to change this now. So I'm trying to follow this um, line of investigation now, like what are they really doing and if they are really doing it or just because it, you know, it's good to say it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I replied to it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. 
Hi. Um, so one of the things that I think we learned in the master's program is that there are a lot of injustices in the world and we can't really solve everything. Um, so I guess just out of curiosity, how do you choose the topics that you focus on, like whether it's, you know, women homelessness or going to the borders to see the, um, the, the migration situation? Mm -hmm. Does grant <laughs> or funding? Yeah, there's not much that? funding on grants <laughs> <laughs> on social issues. Yeah, that's, that's a big thing. Um, I think it's just because I think someone has to do it. And there's so many other people talking about this, um, like migration, for example, um, and about injustices um, and, yeah, human rights um, violations. But in the case of uh, female homelessness, I realized that the only research that was done, it was academical. Or just, we had this case here in Barcelona where a um, woman was burned in a um, bank, I don't know how do you say, cajero, um, in a bank, how do you say? Huh? Yeah, in an ATM, but now the ATMs are closed at night because they don't want people to sleep there because you know, it's a bad image for the city. Uh, but, mm, I know, some years ago, you could go inside and sleep there. You close the, you know, you lock the door. Yeah, I don't know how, how long ago, but it was a really big case in here. Um, yeah, some silly boys, I think, because they were, like, young. They went there and they... Yeah. Mm -hmm. They um, fired, or uh, fired, well, prender fuego, yeah. Yeah, and she died, of course. Um, and in the in journalism, I think we are used to talk about these issues only where there are like big cases and, you know. So I wanted to talk about this, even there's nothing big going on, but for me, there's so many things going on and um, lots of violations. So at least with um, the female homelessness, I thought that if no one is talking in a um, transversal view, I had to do it. So I, I, I had to take pictures of the process. I could share this because I wrote down like, okay, how many different situations can um, no, a woman be in um, so we can relate it to homelessness? So prison, uh, so on and so on. So I said, okay, I want to find a woman for each situation. So people, society, readers from the newspaper, um, library users can really understand that it's not only a woman in the street sleeping rough or you know ATM, and uh, maybe we know some homelessness women, but because we don't connect ideas we don't care. So that's one of the answers. <laughs> and the other one, um, it's not that I really choose or we choose in the cooperative, it's just that we've found the stories and then you, you know, you start pulling, um, then you talk to someone else and you see that there's a relation um, between the stories and say, okay, so that's not only one case, this is something structural. And then you talk to someone else, and no, not only in Barcelona, but in another place and outside of Catalonia, and then you go to the south of Spain and you see, no, actually, I don't know if you've heard of the um, farmers union protests last days. Okay. I um, think today in Publico newspaper, there's this article published on uh, migrant workers in Almeria the south of Spain, because they um, they work in um, invernaderos? Um, Green, greenhouses. Greenhouses. Um, the south of Spain, specifically in Almeria, is called El Mar de Plástico, the plastic um, ocean sea, because you can see from space all the plastic covering the, um, the land. There they grow tomatoes, strawberries, something that they can grow there because it's more it's warmer but even in winter you shouldn't be growing tomatoes um, and there are so many um, human rights violations there so um, i was wondering 
who's going to be the first to talk about these those days because we are supporting farmers of course because they are you no know, uh, they are fighting for their rights too but so there are so many farmers um, with uh, migrant workers being um, forced you know they are doing they are slavers in some cases so I, I sent to myself to my WhatsApp group with myself uh, this morning this article to read it at some point of the day. Um, I think it's in Spanish only, but I think it's really really interesting no? to, to see that one uh, fight can bring you to another fight and one violation can take you to another one. So yeah, thank you. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you what piece of advice could you give to young uh, photographers, women, as for example, us, to do like the jump start to the professional work? Because uh, I think it's so difficult being journalist and or photographer as a hobby. But if you wanted to be professional, where can you start? <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> I think that's the most difficult one. Um, it took me years, and I don't work as a photographer or as a journalist all my, you know, um, every day, or I work in a cooperative, and this morning I had to work with InDesign. Have you ever worked with InDesign? Okay, so I'm trying to design a scientific poster for another cooperative because they asked that, we needed the money, and it's like, okay, I can do that. So I do random things too, and that's fine. But it took me a lot of time to, to publish in a newspaper or to take the pictures I wanted to take because I've, been, I've done really bad pictures and I've written really bad articles <laughs> before all this work. Um, but something I learned is that your CV is not going to help as much as your contact. And yeah, that's sad for me. But I also think that you really have to go and talk to people, not being shy, not thinking that your work uh, worth uh, less because you're young or because you're, you know, you're starting. Um, learning from everything. Sometimes I saw myself attending to a um, uh, talk or to a keynote or a, um, and say like, what am I doing here? Well, maybe you write down something, some idea or some contact and three years later say, oh, I want to explore this. It rings a bell that I've, I've known someone in this field. So let me, you know, um, so I would say it takes time. It's fine. Don't worry, <laughs> um, but I would also say try to be surrounded but by good people, not only the ones making money, <laughs> because um, I'm lucky that the company I worked in, um, I don't know if you were already here when I explained that, that I worked in an online marketing company. I was working for five-star hotels, um, like writing content, and I was like, what am I doing here? It's fine. Don't worry. I mean, I tell to my you no know, younger um, younger Claudia that it's fine because I had the purpose. I needed to save money to be freelance and to leave my parents' house, and I was learning, and that's fine because I was very young. But that time, um, but for example, I wouldn't accept now the same job I accepted in Vienna, but I know that it was twenty two years that. 22 years again, I would take it again. It's fine. I don't say it as a mistake, for example. Um, but as an adult or um, grown up now, I would say to myself, don't let people talk to you this way. Or, you know, like I would give advice to myself <laughs> as a younger person. But um, I don't think there's a formula or there's an advice. I would say just. Trust your gut, you know, when you see like, mm, I don't like this or I, I'm not feeling comfortable with this person or with this job or, and of course it depends on your economical situation. That's for me very, you know, a, a key thing. 
I've worked as a waitress in Primavera Sound. I've never been in Primavera Sound as an attendee, but I've been um, uh, serving beers to drunk tourists. And that's fine. I've done really silly jobs, but because I need the money, I need fine. Um, but I don't think there's one formula. I think you have to try <laughs> and see what comes out of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks so much for sharing your experience. And I think it's really a very delicate work that shows empathy. And um, me, myself, I really want to dedicate to some works that helps like vulnerable groups. But um, a problem that I have in mind now that uh, we like actually we, we are not on the top of the pyramid, pyramid either. Um, but there are clearly that people like uh, female homeless, they are facing like more intersectional problems than us. So I, I don't want to like show them that I'm like savior, like I'm here to help you, like I can solve your problem, like what th those like uh, men from North do. <laughs> Do and uh, yeah, I, I want to know how to avoid that you, uh, in the process of helping them, how to avoid that you do it in a, from a arrogant perspective. Mm. Thank you for the empathy thing <laughs> you said. Um, I can tell you what I do, and if that um, gives you a hint, um, as I said to. Uh, before, um, I always try to explain like the m clearly why I'm doing this interview or this job, taking this picture. And um, I know I have privileges compared to them, but because I'm trying to use these privileges to explain or to, to be a, a bridge between their experiences to the tools I have. So I would um, try to think this first, like, okay, I have privileges, how can I use them? Because that's something that um, makes me ne nervous most of the time, like, I feel bad because they are exhibited in the library, I don't want them to think that I'm taking advantage of their vulnerable situation, but I've shared this with some of them, like, I feel this way, what do you think? And Julia, Ana Maria, they told me, it's fine, don't worry, it's fine because we gave you permission to do this. We know why you're doing this. We hope we can help. That's what they say, you know? Um, they want other women, in this case, to know that they are places they can go to be helped. They want some like people in the library, you know, the users, to know that um, this is happening in the next door. Um, so I use my privileges to, yeah, to do what I, I know to do, That's interviewing people, taking pictures, and, um, and sharing the stories they, they told. So I think if you are honest with yourself and with others, I mean, everything can happen, but I think that's like, no, the, the step to begin with, just explaining. And if you have contradictions, it's fine to share them. I mean, that's what I did, and it helped me to feel less savior or guilty, you know, to do, the, to do so. And, and also because I, on, I don't only put the exhibition there in the library, I do commented um, visits, I try to uh, make net, network between the library and the neighborhoods and um, schools, you know? So, so many people can know this reality. And then I share some of the comments I received from the people to the women, no? the, um, they are the, the women I, I've known, um, because they, they asked me, hey, where's the exhibition now? What are you doing? No, what are you up to? And sometimes I share what people tell me uh, because I know I've received comments like, they are so brave, please tell them that I, I'm happy that they share their stories. Or some other says like, some people ask me, maybe you wanted to ask that, I, <laughs> I advance, um, what's the most difficult thing for you to do in these stories, no? And 
I tell this to, to the women and they say, they ask me that. It's like, no, 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 it's good. I'm not the, <laughs> I'm not the, the main uh, character here. You are. And, and for me, this is a good thing no? to share and to be clear from the very beginning. Yeah. I don't know if that helps. Um, thank you again. Um, I think I wanted to ask something that was related to the last point. Um, considering a lot of us on this master's, similar to you, would like to have a, a career and pursue something that is meaningful and impactful and uh, helps communities. Um, but that is a barrier for a lot of us in just like finding good, like well-paid work and obviously you know the rent prices. Um, and just wondering like for your cooperative, how the, the structure works, like how do, how do you make money and, and whether you're able to receive a salary from that? Um, like do you have some sort of stability through, through what you do and, and how does that work? Mm -hmm. Now we don't have much stability, <laughs> I would say. It's um, like a roller coaster sometimes because um, we received some, I would say, like grants or, yeah. But um, it's most going out and selling our services. <laughs> um, we do this intercooperative um, uh, work because we try to... Um, yeah, to work with some other people, um, but mainly because, um, for example, I live here in Barcelona, but my colleagues live in Maresma. Do you know what Maresma? In the coast, up to Girona. So we don't work and live in the same place. And that's a good and a bad thing. <laughs> a bad thing because we don't see each other every day, but a good thing because um, we have a wider network, for example. But um, is it stressful? <laughs> is it stressful to... Um, to depend on yourself <laughs> to to get paid every month. Um, it took a while. When I um, joined the cooperative, there was a stability, but my colleagues, um, there was a, a guy called Marti. He started with Sara, the cooperative, in 2017. They didn't get paid. I mean, they were working in other places, and in their free time, they were starting the cooperative. And that happened to everyone I know so far. So at first, um, yeah, you have your job. And then when you finish at five, at six, then you start your other project, your other work. I wouldn't say that's ideal. I, I wish it wasn't like this. But that's the experience I have and my colleagues too. So when once you have you know, a name and people know you and, and you know other people and you inter corporate, corporate, um, it's easier. But for me, it's so stressful to know that I have a person. I mean, my, my colleagues Sarah and I, we can, I mean, we shouldn't, <laughs> um, we shouldn't allow ourselves not to get paid. But what we cannot do is not paying our worker, Laura. So that's our main goal every month, to have enough um, work so she can get paid and she has her salary. And then us. But of course, I mean, Sara, she has a mortgage, she has to pay, I have a rent, so I have to pay. Um, we could get paid less if that was the case, but we try not to get to this point. But yeah, it's a lot of effort. But in days like today, I'm so happy I'm doing this. I'm not in the online marketing company or doing something else because um, I've been able to do what I like, what I think it's worth doing. Um, with my privilege, I've been able to, you know, to do the research and sharing it with some other people. But I was working till 9 p.m. yesterday. Today I was at 8 a.m. in my computer. Um, and this week, this week is going to be really, really hard because we are... Um, we have a documentary to um, handle. Handle is more like a paper, but we have to send uh, to deliver. Thank you to deliver a documentary. Uh, we've been working for the um, whole last year, and we're rushing <laughs> to to be in time. So sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's so grateful. I wish we could not um, 
get never nervous or um, stressed because of the money, because I don't like capitalism logics. <laughs> But the world works as it works, so it's trying to find the balance uh, between the world and our utopic uh, world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No. Well, I think it's we have abused our speaker enough. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you thank again. You. Thank you so much. It has been great. Thank you.